Daniel chapter 11, if you'll turn there, please. Been going through the book of Daniel on Sunday nights, and um, we come to chapter 11. It's going to be somewhat of a teachy type sermon tonight. Uh, there is so much to say that I could literally spend the next three hours going verse by verse. Uh, through this chapter as we look at Daniel's vision. So what I'd like to do tonight is kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what Daniel is seeing here in Daniel chapter 11. And so I'm not going to read through the whole chapter because really what I'm going to cover, believe it or not, and I, and I couldn't find any other way to deal with this. Uh, I'm sure there is, but I couldn't find it. Uh, really the whole story, the whole th vision that Daniel's dealing with begins in verse 1 and goes all the way through to chapter 12 and verse 3. And so again I'm going to do my best to explain in a teachy type way hopefully tonight and don't worry I'll get some preachy in there to give us an understanding. So let's stand together if you're able to stand. I'm just going to pick some verses here along the way. Let's begin in verse 1. Also I in the first year of Darius the Mede even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. The fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. That's Greece. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and shall have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Look at verse 13. For the king of the north shall return, and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. Look over at verse 21. Speaking of this king of the north again. So notice, if you will, he talks about kings that will come after Darius the Mede and Cyrus at the beginning. And then he tells how there will be a division of a southern king and a northern king. And we find in verse 13 that the northern king shall prevail. I'll talk about this in a moment. Then we get down to verse 21. And in his, the northern king's estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Look over at verse 30. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant so shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Still speaking, by the way, of the northern king. We want to talk about him in a moment. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Look at verse 35. And some of them, understanding, shall fall to try them and to purge, and to make them white even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Amen. The king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, 
And a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall call, cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. These are two different kings, by the way, than previously in the chapter. With chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasure of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end. Amen. And none shall help him. Chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble which has never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that, shall, that, be, I'm sorry, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever Amen. and ever. Amen. We'll stop there. Quite a challenge, this chapter. Amen. What does it mean? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I need your help tonight as I preach your word. Lord, please help me as I, as I give forth what I believe uh, you've led me to give and help us, Lord, to understand what you're saying here in this chapter, what it means and how it pertains to us. So I beg you this evening for a fresh filling of thy spirit. Please remove distractions from this room and from our minds and may our hearts and minds be fixed upon thee and your word this evening. Lord, we understand that we cannot understand without thy spirit. Amen. And so please, by your spirit, give us understanding. Stir our hearts as New Testament believers to understand how this ought to affect us today. Please help me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Last week in Daniel chapter 10, we looked at the beginning of Daniel's fourth and final vision in the book of Daniel. Since Daniel chapter 7, God has been revealing to us through Daniel some things about the future of Daniel's people, the Jews. The future of the Jews and also the future Gentile empires that God would use to accomplish His purpose with His people. Amen. Now, I've been debating as to whether or not to go back to this chapter, and I think I will. Hold your hand here and go back to Genesis chapter 12. Let me see if I can explain something to us. In Genesis chapter 12, we find what we refer to as the Abrahamic covenant. Notice verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, Amen. and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, Amen. and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Amen. This is what we refer to as the Abrahamic covenant.
covenant. Amen. It is an unconditional covenant. What God is promising to Abraham is that a great nation would come forth from Abram. Now we know what that nation is, do we not? Amen. The nation of Israel. And the land of Palestine would be given to Abram and his seed forever. Forever. The Jews would number as the dust of the earth. Although many would try to stomp them out throughout history, none would succeed. Why is that? Because of the Abrahamic covenant. They couldn't do it. Those that blessed the Jews would be blessed by God. And those that cursed the Jews would be cursed by God. And the Messiah would come through Abram's genealogy. He'd come the first time to die for the sins of the world at his first coming. But then when he comes again, he would come to rule and reign the earth on the throne of David at his second coming. Amen. He would do this, by the way, from his throne in Jerusalem. So understand that these visions and these dreams and these things that God is giving to Daniel, he is revealing to us and to Daniel both how and when he will make all of this come to pass. Now, back to Daniel. So far, God has shown these things to Daniel through four distinct visions. Now, you can flip back there. I've asked us every week to do this. If you'd flip back to chapter 7, the first vision, notice in verse 1, was in the first year of Belshazzar. Now, that was when Daniel saw the four great beasts depicting the four great Gentile world empires. The Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and then the Roman Empire and its three stages. The conquering stage, the end times stage with the ten nation coalition, and then the Antichrist stage. That was Daniel's first vision. Look over at chapter 8 and verse 1. We see two years later, now it's the third year of Belshazzar, here in chapter 8, and Daniel gets now his second vision. This is a vision of the ram and the he-goat. The ram, of course, depicting the Medo-Persian Empire, and the he-goat depicting the Grecian Empire. This chapter would explain to Daniel the details of a great persecution that would come upon God's people under a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. We'll hear about him a lot tonight. A Grecian leader who typifies the Antichrist. You know, we could kind of say that Daniel chapter 11 is somewhat of an amplification of what we already heard in Daniel chapter 8. You'll see that in a few moments, I hope. Then we saw Daniel's third vision. Look at chapter 9 and verse 1. Ten years later, in the first year of Darius the Mede, God would now, in a miraculous vision, reveal to Daniel when these things would come to pass. It's amazing. It's a vision we refer to as the 70 weeks of Daniel. Amen. He talks about the seven weeks would come. Of course, we know weeks being groups of years. The temple would be rebuilt. 62 weeks later, Messiah would come and be rejected. And then there'd be that one final week uh, that would be later that we know is coming, uh, we know as the tribulation period, that 70th week of Daniel. Amen. In between is the church age. If that's confusing to you, get the CD and maybe it'll help. <laughs> I can't go through the whole message again. That was his third vision. Now here we find in chapter 10, Daniel's final vision. Now, this vision is recorded for us not in one chapter, but in three. Chapter 10, chapter 11, and chapter 12. And we said last week that we could divide this vision this way. Chapter 10 would be the introduction to the vision. Chapter 11 would be the vision itself. 
And then chapter 12, we could call the conclusion of the vision. Now, last week, we dealt with the introduction of Daniel's vision. We talked about Daniel and the person he was and all of that. Won't get into that again. But tonight, what we're going to deal with, God willing and with God's help, Amen. is the vision itself. As I read through this, I've came, come to learn once again that we have an amazing God. Amen. An absolutely amazing God who gives to us here in Daniel chapter 11 an absolute astounding vision. And the reason it's astounding is because of its historical accuracy. Amen. It's amazing to me. I'd like for us to notice a phrase that we find in verse 35. I have to admit, I changed the title three times. So you're going to get the third one. I want you to notice verse 35. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end. Watch this. Because it is yet for a time appointed. Tonight I want to preach on this subject. If you like titles and you like to take notes, I do when I listen to preaching. The subject is a time appointed. Amen. There's a time coming to this world Amen. that you and I cannot stop. Amen. There's a time coming to this world that even the world cannot stop. God has a plan for this world, and may I say, His plan is going right now exactly as planned. Amen. And it's going to come to pass. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Because the Bible says so. Amen. Because we have the Word of God. Amen. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that the Bible is God's Word. Amen. No doubt. You know, matter of fact, the more I study it, the more I realize it is. I know that because, first of all, it claims itself to be, in Hebrews 4.12, calls itself the Word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed it to be the Word of God. In John 17.17, 17, He said, Thy Word is truth. But it also proves itself to be the Word of God as well. And perhaps the greatest proof, and I've said this over and over again, if you've been under my preaching and in my Sunday school class for any amount of time, you'll hear this again and again, that the greatest proof that the Bible is true for me is fulfilled prophecy. Everything that the Bible has said would happen has happened. Which makes me believe this. Everything it says is going to happen... In the same way it has been filled, what has happened, that's going, to be hap that's going to happen as well. I confuse myself on that one. But I think you know what I mean. So let me ask you this. Do you believe that? Amen. All right. Let me ask you the next question. Are we living like it? Amen. Are we living like we believe the Bible's true? Amen. Let's take some time here, a little bit, Let's do what I can do. And see what God is showing us in this fourth vision. Notice number one, if you're taking notes, the particulars that God reveals. For the first 35 verses of chapter 11, God is going to, or He is revealing to Daniel, to us through Daniel, an astoundingly detailed, specific undeniably accurate account of the events that would take place from Daniel's day all the way down really to a man called Antiochus Epiphanes. In other words, from King Cyrus in 536 B.C. I'm talking about the first 35 verses now. We'll get to the rest. But for the first 35 verses, God is going to take us to an amazing journey. He shows us specifically from the days of Daniel and Cyrus, the king of the Medo-Persian king, step by step all the way down to the year 168 B.C., nearly four centuries in advance, he shows us what's going to happen. Let's notice, first of all, number one is this, the details of this history. Well, let's look at it, verse 2 of chapter 11. We read, and now will I show thee the truth, 
Behold, there shall stand up yet, notice, three kings in Persia. And the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. By the way, that's exactly what happened. Amen. Wow. God is saying here, in 536 B.C., as Cyrus is the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, that there would be three more Medo-Persian kings before a fourth successor. Amen. Who were those kings? Well, we know from history. In case you're wondering, oh, let me show you. We'll go here. Let's have some fun tonight. Amen? Amen. Let's go back to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. As we look back on history, as we can look back at it, we find that there were indeed three more Persian kings. The first one we find in Ezra chapter 4 and verse 6. And you may want to either write or circle these names in your Bible if you do that sort of thing. If not, just look at them. Notice Ezra chapter 4 and verse 6. And in the reign of... Ahasuerus. Now, if I'm not pronouncing that right, I'm sure I'll get corrected later. But that's how I'm going with it tonight. <laughs> this was the king that succeeded Cyrus from 529 to 522 B.C. Look at verse 7, because he's covering in the book of Ezra a span of time. There is a second king in verse 7, and in the days of, write this one or circle it, Artaxerxes. He reigned from 522 to 521 B.C. The next king, go down to chapter 4 and verse 24. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased, notice, under the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So exactly what God said would happen, happened. You had Ahasuerus, 529, Artaxerxes, 522, and Darius in 486 B.C. But then he says in the book of Daniel that there would be a fourth king shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Go to Esther chapter 1. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Let's have some fun here tonight. Amen. Amen. Here we find who this fourth king was. You know him and I do as well. Notice it says, Now it came to pass in es Esther chapter 1 and verse 1. It came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia. Over 107 and 20 provinces. This is the fourth king. This is the king that made Esther queen. We know from history that just like Daniel said, he amassed great wealth. He had prepared a huge army over a four-year period. And his goal was to do exactly what is said in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 2. He would stir up all, the, all against the realm of Grisha. And that's what he did in 480 B.C. He amassed an army and he attempted to overthrow Greece. But he failed. It never happened. But may I say this? Greece never forgot what he did. Amen. And 150 years later, going back to Daniel chapter 11, we read in verse 3, And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. We know that 150 years after that invasion, a man remembered through, his, through history what this king did, this Medo-Persian king did, and he rose up with a vengeance, and he went in and he conquered not only the Medo-Persian empire, but the known world very, very quickly. You say, who's that? Alexander the Great. And he made Greece the next Gentile world empire. But notice what happens in verse 4 of Daniel 11. 
Now, I can't do this through every verse until chapter 12. Like I said, we'll be here till midnight. And when he shall stand up, notice, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. You say, what happened? What's that talking about? Alexander the Great would die at the age of 32. Some of this is review for us. It was the year 323 B.C. But his empire that he left, by the way, he, he conquered everything. He died as a drunk. He sat there one day and said to someone, as he conquered everything he could conquer, he said, there's, no, there's nothing left for me to conquer. And he drunk himself to death. So much for power satisfying the soul of man. Amen. Wow. Alexander dies at the age of 32. But yes, he had children, but his empire would not be left to his posterity. Notice that's what it says in verse 4, not to his posterity, but it would be divided between the four winds of heaven. What's that mean? His four generals. Alexander's kingdom, of course, within 15 years, all of his children would have been dead. And his empire gets divided between his four generals. But two of those generals, without getting into all the details, and their kingdoms would eventually rise to power uh, from the break off of Alexander the Great. There would be a king of the south and there would be a king of the north. The king of the south would be the Ptolemies. They would be centered in Egypt. The king of the north would be Seleucus. In Syria and Mesopotamia, that would later be the Seleucid Empire. Please remember those if you can. Then from verses 5 through 20, what we read of here is the struggle for power between the southern part of the Grecian Empire, the Ptolemies, and the northern part of the Grecian Empire, the Seleucids, and we see them fighting and battling, at times uniting one with another. Then many years of wars, there were marriages with kings, daughters, to try to promote peace. Back and forth they went. Read through those verses. Look at history. It's an exact match. These uh, were times of peace, times of fighting. And it's described in detail, eventually the northern king, Seleucid, would prevail. But he would prevail under a certain man. Which brings me to the second point. Not only the details of the history, verses 2 through 20, but then notice the demagogue that arose. Who arises out of this? I was going to say the dude that arose. <laughs> but I thought I'd be a little bit more classy tonight and say the demagogue that arose. Notice in verse 21, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person. You see what happened was after the death of Seleucid, the northern king, a man would rise to power uh, and would reign from 175 to 165 BC. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. He was not the rightful heir to the throne, but he took the throne doing exactly what we read in verse 21. Amen. Using flatteries, using manipulation. This Antiochus Epiphanes that rose up out of the, from the kingdom of the north, the Seleucid Empire, was a very wicked and a very evil man. Listen to how history describes him. Secular historians. He is a vile, very immoral man, given to drunkenness, lasciviousness, uncleanness, and unnatural lusts. I think you know what that means. He lived a lascivious and foolish lifestyle, drinking with strangers and people of low life. You know, the, even the people in Greece, instead of calling him Antiochus Epiphanes, which Epiphanes means God manifest, they had a nickname for him. They called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means a madman. That's what they thought of him. Notice how our text describes this man from verses 21 all the way down to 35. 
Verse 21 says he's a vile person. Verse 24 says he wins the popularity of the people by, watch this, plundering from the rich and giving to the poor for their su support. Sounds like a redistribution of wealth. In verses 25 through 27, we find that it was Antiochus Epiphanes that conquered the Ptolemies of the south. We see in verses 31 and 32, what does he do under his reign? He invades Palestine. He orders all to worship the Greek deities. The temple sacrifices were stopped. He stole the silver and the gold from the temple of God. He took pigs and he sacrificed them to the Greek gods in the very holy place in the temple. By the way, that's what he's talking about in verse 31 when he talks about the abomination that maketh death desolate. Jews were ordered to participate or die. The Old Testament scriptures, he attempted to destroy them. And many Orthodox Jews were in a quandary. They either had to obey what Antiochus Epiphanes said, or they had to die. And many Jews were killed during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. You know, over a period of three days, he killed 80,000 Jews. And he sold 40,000 of them into slavery. Here's my point. Here's why I'm saying all this. You say, preacher, that, it's, by the way, there's a lot more to it if you pick apart this passage. But what I'm trying to say this evening is this. One of the most amazing things about all of this is that our God in heaven describes these events hundreds of years before they happened. And they all came true to a T. Everything God said came true to a T. May I remind us tonight that the Bible is not like a fortune cookie. Amen? Where you crack it open and you read something like this. Oh, you're going to have a good day today. And you have a good day. You think, oh, look at this. This must mean something. No, it does not. It's not like a fortune cookie. It's not like Gene Dixon that would say, predict that you're going to meet a stranger today. Well, no kidding. No kidding. Well, that's, a, that's a revelation right there. That's really going out on a limb. The Bible gives us detailed prediction, uh, prophecy, prediction and prophecy of times and events, uh, of things that will happen, uh, and even tells us at times when it's going to happen. And the Bible is 100% accurate. You see, fulfilled prophecy proves to me that the Bible is true. And a chapter like this ought to make our heads spin. A chapter like this ought to boost our confidence in the Bible. You know what's amazing to me is what the critics say of this chapter. They don't know what to do with it. Critics of the Bible have argued that Daniel could not have written chapter 11. No way. That's what they say. They say it's absolutely impossible. It had to be written at a later date after the events occurred because nothing could be that accurate unless it's reporting on something that already happened. Well, the problem with that is this. They don't understand God. They, they don't understand our God in heaven. They don't understand the sovereignty of God. And by the way, they don't want to admit that there's a God in heaven. Because if they admit that Daniel wrote this, uh, God did through Daniel, that would mean that God is real. That means that God is the ruler, and he makes the rules, and we don't. Oh, my word, this ought to help us to improve in our belief and our confidence in the Bible. So we see the particulars that God reveals. And again, we saw the details of history and the dude that arose, the demagogue. Number two, notice the promises that God makes. So watch this now. Just as much as God promises those former things to happen, he's promised also some future things to happen. 
Do you know, notice in verse 35, from verse 35 on to the end of the chapter, he is now talking about, notice, even to the time of the end. Amen. The time of the end. Verse 40, and at the time of the end. You see, these, while the first 34 verses, or yeah, 34 verses, we'll say, deal with uh, the history from uh, uh, Cyrus all the way down to Antiochus Epiphanes and what he did and how he got to his position, these prophecies from verses 36 to 45 will be fulfilled by who he was the type of, and that is the Antichrist during the tribulation period. He is shifting here now to the time of the end where this Antiochus Epiphanes pictured the one that is to come in the future. Right. And that is the Antichrist. Right. He's coming, by the way. Amen. We know from the book of 1 John that there are many Antichrists in the world, and we understand the spirit of Antichrist is already working. But there's going to come a day in the future where there will be a physical Antichrist on this earth. Amen. You say, when, how, who, what, what's it all about? Well, let's find out. What can we learn about the Antichrist from the Bible? Well, three things. First of all, number one, his manifestation. When are we going to know where, when are we going to know if he's here? Well, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you would. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Bible is quite clear that the Antichrist will not be revealed until after the church age saints are raptured. Amen, yeah. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. He is, now, he may exist. I am kind of of the conviction that he might very well be alive today. Maybe a baby. Maybe a teenager. Not in our church, of course. Maybe an adult. Maybe a man that if we look out in the political scene and the rulers of some of these countries, maybe it's someone, one of them. But you know that we won't know it until after the rapture. Amen. Notice 2 Thessalonians 2. And by the way, if you're saved, you won't be here. Amen. Amen. Notice in verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians 2, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Talking about the Antichrist, the man of sin. What is withholding? Notice, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Notice, only he who now letteth will let. By the way, that's speaking of the Holy Spirit of God. Until he be taken out of the way. When it, where's the Holy Spirit of God indwelling today? Believers. And when he is taken out of the way, when we are raptured out of here, notice verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed. You see, the Antichrist is going to emerge as the head of a ten-nation coalition. We don't know exactly what that is. There's been much speculation over the years. At one point, when the United Nations began, folks thought, there it is, this nation, national coalition, or a coalition of nations. Some have thought at one time, the European Union, uh, perhaps it's some other coalition. But understand, he's going to emerge uh, as a leader of that coalition. He's going to start out as a man of peace. He's going to befriend Israel and the world. He is going to seemingly solve the Middle East problem. He is going to bring, I believe, a sense of security and stability after the rapture happens. It's going to be chaos in this world. Right. They're going, people are going to look for answers. Who is going to help us? And here arises this man who's very winsome and can lead this world through this troublous times. He will eventually head up the one world government and the one world religion midway through the tribulation after he makes that covenant with Israel, solving the Middle East uh, problem halfway through the tribulation. He's going to break that covenant with Israel and there will be a wholesale slaughter of the Jews and believers and those who refuse to worship him and that refuse to take the mark of the beast. 
He's coming. There's no doubt about it. There's a time appointed. What can we do to stop it? Can't. What can we do to change it? Can't. How can we stop this uh, uh, tribulation, this tragedy from happening? You can't. You can't. We go back to Daniel 11. We see his manifestation, but we also see his mannerisms. Notice how he's described, and, I, and I'm moving as fast as I can. <laughs> Look at verse 36. What's he going to be like? Chapter 11, verse 36. The king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the uh, indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. By the way, a mirror passage to 2 Thessalonians 2. I didn't read it all, but it's there. But in his estate shall, be, uh, shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and with pleasant things. Uh, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. What's he going to do? He's going to magnify himself above God. He's going to seek to be worshipped as God. He's going to speak marvelous, wicked, evil things against the God of the Bible. And by the way, comparing this with the book of Revelation, he's going to align himself with the mother of harlots. In Revelation 17, some believe because of what's said here regarding the God of his, not regarding the God of his fathers, that perhaps he'll be a Jew. Or perhaps a Roman Catholic. I'm just saying what some say. But he's going to be an evil man. Right. So we see his manifestation when it is. We see his mannerisms. Notice his military. What's he going to do? He's going in verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief uh, of the children of Ammon. That's the country of Jordan, by the way. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries. Uh, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. What's he going to do? It's going to be warfare. Yep, right. We know when he y yokes up or makes that covenant with, uh, uh, with the nation of Israel, that's going to stir up the Muslim nations. And he's going to be attacked by the Muslim countries for his alignment with Israel. He will be victorious against that attack. He will set up his headquarters in Jerusalem, but then suddenly in the middle of the whole thing, he's going to turn on the nation of Israel. Right. And all of the armies of the world will eventually converge, and I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version here, Amen. will converge on Israel in the Valley of Megiddo for the Battle Armageddon. of Armageddon. Amen. My wife and I stood there, It's an amazing thing just to stand there and look and think of that. Amen. We stood upon this mountain there, and you overlooked this huge valley, the Jezreel Valley. And you look from one end to the other, and you see this great, great plain. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And over there, there's hills. And you think of all the armies of the world are going to converge in this place for the Battle of Armageddon. World War III, perhaps. The worst war that the world has ever seen. Amen. Against Israel, against God's people. Right here. Hmm. You say, that doesn't sound like a good ending. Well, I like happy endings. Amen. I like happy endings. You see, there's more to it. I didn't finish reading it. We saw the particulars that God reveals, the promise God makes that these things are going to happen. But then I want to show you the person that's going to put him down. I love verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Watch this. Yet he shall come to his end. Amen. And none shall help him. Right. 
And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since it was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. You know what this is talking about? It's talking about an event that has been prophesied for thousands of years, that has been anticipated as far back as the days of Enoch, according to the book of Jude. That's been long awaited for every generation of Jews and believers of alike. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Lord. He's coming again. The Lord. To put down the enemies of this world Amen. and the enemies of God's people. You know that the, 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 the revelation of Christ is mentioned 318 times in the New Testament. Every single New Testament penman mentions the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, the only doctrine that is mentioned more than the second coming of Jesus Christ is the doctrine of salvation. Why is that? Because he's coming again. Amen. And don't forget, the revelation of Jesus Christ is distinct from the rapture. At the rapture, prior to the tribulation, the Lord will meet his church-age saints in the air. It will be in the moment. It will be in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, at the rapture, the world will not see the Lord. See, the rapture is going to leave everybody perplexed. But the revelation is completely different. Different. The revelation of Jesus Christ, also known as the second coming, is when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, shall come the second time. He will come literally. He will come visibly. He will come physically. He will return to earth in all of his glory, displaying to all the earth once and for all that he is indeed the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And he'll put down all his enemies. Oh, we could go on. I might deal with chapter 12 a little bit in a couple weeks. But he is going to resurrect Old Testament and tribulation saints. That's what we read in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And he will set up his millennial kingdom where he will rule and reign forever. Israel will have their king. Israel will have their land. And you and I as believers will rule and reign with them through the millennial millennial age. That's how it goes. That's the story. You say, is that going to happen? Um, yeah. Because it is yet for a time appointed. So I said all that to say this. The Bible's true. I said all that to say this. If you and I can, and we should, by the way, I think we ought to, if we had chandeliers again, maybe swing from them tonight about the second coming of Christ. Oh, yeah. hallelujah! Yeah. We'll let that one time. That's why I took them down, by the way. <laughs> Too much of that going on. If he's coming again, if all of this has happened, the Gentile nations, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the future time where uh, the Antichrist is going to arise, uh, and all of this is going to happen, and we see, yes, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, the Bible's true. Everything he said would happen, happened. That means everything he says is going to happen, is going to happen. Right. Amen. Do we live like it? Most of us don't. It's more of a nod of a head. It's more of a yeah. Amen. It's more of an, an emotional excitement. And it should be. But it needs to go beyond that. If you and I truly believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. And by the way, the rapture of the church age saints could happen at any moment. If you truly believe that. Uh, should I say, and I believe we believe that, but how much do we believe it? Can I, maybe I should put it that way. It should change Amen. our lives. Right. You know, when they left, when Jesus Christ, and I'm done here, when Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven, he told his disciples, said, Lord, now, you going to set up that kingdom now? He said, oh, no, 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 no. It's not for you to know the times, the right. seasons appointed unto the Father. 
But I got something for you to do. I want you to be witness of me. Uh, you, you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses right. of me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Right. And you do that and re remember this, I'm coming back Amen. at any moment. Amen. And what do we see, see them doing? Man, everyone, like wildfire, like wildfire going out into the world uh, uh, daily in the temple and every house, uh, ceasing not to teach and preach uh, Jesus Christ, having a burden for souls, uh, having a burden for people, uh, lighting this world on fire with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we saw. Amen. That's what we saw. So what happened to us? Maybe we need a little bit of a fire lit under us, un Amen. under us today. Amen. And remember once again, this book is true. Jesus Amen. Christ is coming again. And you and I need to get busy for God. Right. Because all the things that we waste our time on, right. all those things are going to amount to nothing more than a pile of ashes at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Nothing more than that. Amen. The time is appointed. Amen. It's coming. Let's live like it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.